Hi, Tony DeWitt, Missouri Appellate Attorney and a guy who answers questions here on YouTube. Several of you have asked questions about my take on the Chauvin trial, and I wanted to take a few days to let things settle down and think a little bit more about what happened before I put my thoughts into a video. So that's what I've done, and today I'm going to discuss what I see in the Chauvin uh, trial and verdict. So let me begin first by saying that I have not looked at all of the evidence. I didn't see all of the trial testimony. I didn't watch gavel to gavel coverage uh, of the trial. I did see some news reports of it. Um, I thought the major media news coverage of it was very biased and very slanted in, uh, in derogation of Mr. Uh, Chauvin. Um, but the news media is entitled to cover it as they see fit, and apparently that's how they saw the trial. Uh, I've also seen some coverage of some of the cross-examination by some of the more conservative media outlets, and on balance, I think it was probably a little bit more fair, at least as it was to Mr. Chauvin. Now, I don't want anybody to take away from this an idea that I am criticizing the jury, because I'm not. I think the jury made the decision that it had to make, and I'll explain that a little bit more here in a little bit. But because I didn't see the evidence and everything like that, I can't really criticize the jury. And really, we shouldn't criticize juries. We empower them to make the best decision they can make under the circumstances, and that's apparently what happened here. I want to talk a little bit about the judge. I thought the judge had the absolute right demeanor to uh, take on this trial. Uh, first of all, he was very calm. He was uh, very thoughtful. He was uh, meticulous in how he handled things, and I thought on balance he gave the defense what he should have given them, uh, and he probably gave the state what he should have given the state. Uh, as to his legal rulings uh, on Minnesota law, I have no opinion on those. I'm sure that they were uh, carefully considered and well thought out. In spite of trying his best to put together a good jury trial, the judge made five serious errors. And these are errors of omission. They were not intentional errors. He was not biased against the defendant, <clears throat> at least not obviously. I suppose he might have had some hidden bias, but it's certainly none that came through in his rulings or in his demeanor or in his charge to the jury. The first error he made was in not changing venue. You have to remember that there were riots in Minnesota. Minneapolis was almost burned to the ground. I think I saw an estimate somewhere where there were almost $2 billion worth of property damage in Minnesota, in, in Minneapolis, the Minneapolis area, after the original incident that caused Chauvin to be tried for murder. So where you have that kind of passion and that kind of history of violence coming out of the, of the events, to leave the trial in that venue, I think, speaks very badly about what you consider to be one of the more important considerations, whether or not it's possible to pick a fair jury in that situation. Again, I think this was an error. I don't think it was intentional. I think it was just the judge had a good view of the, of the public and he believed they could put aside what had happened. I think the result seems to me to show the opposite of that. We'll talk about that in a minute. The second error that the judge made in this case is that he failed to sequester the jury. Juries need to be sequestered in high-profile cases because the media and all of the people that a juror comes into contact with affect how a case is ultimately viewed by that juror. 
Why is that important? It's important because the juror needs to rely on what they remember from the trial, the evidence that they saw and heard, and what they think about the evidence that they saw and heard, not what other people think about what they saw and heard. Because the public at large will always get more evidence and more facts and more opinions circulated to them than will the jury if the jury is sequestered. In this case, the jury was not sequestered. Now, the judge asked the jury not to look at the news media, but that gets back to the third error. The third error was not the actual instruction to ignore the news media. I think that was a good instruction, but only if you presume that only the media had some influence over this jury. They didn't. Every one of those jurors had iPhones or iPads or computers or something else, and they don't have to look at the news. They don't have to be exposed to the media to be influenced. There's Facebook, there's Twitter, there's all kinds of other outside influences that can have an impact on their thinking. And he didn't tell them necessarily to avoid looking at that. I'm sure he told them not to post anything on social media, but he didn't tell them not to look at it. And that's a problem. And even if he did tell them not to look at it, by not sequestering it, we can't be certain that they did not. The fourth error, I think I probably wasn't really aware of until I saw the coverage of the verdict. Out in front of the courthouse on the day that the verdict was reached, there was basically a carnival atmosphere. There were people with all kinds of signs. There were people who were obviously there to protest in favor of a guilty verdict. I don't know whether or not there were any others there. Uh, there may have been, but it wasn't obvious because the media tends to show only what they show. But the bottom line was there were thousands of people out there around the courthouse, and that creates an intimidating factor to the jury. How is a jury going to reach a decision that says a person's not guilty and then have to walk out through, even if they're escorted by the police, how are they going to walk out through that mob? The judge should have established a safe zone around the courthouse so that the jury was not influenced or intimidated by the mob that gathered around it. The fifth and I think most important error that the judge made was in not declaring a mistrial after Maxine Waters' remarks were announced and after Joe Biden's remarks were announced. I don't think that there is any way that those comments did not reach the jury and did not have the capacity to influence the jury. You know, it is amazing how quickly we forget the lessons that history teaches us. One of the more important cases of the 1960s was that of Dr. Sam Shepard. Sam Shepard was arrested, tried, and convicted for the murder of his wife, Marilyn. He was tried in, in uh, state court. He was convicted in 1954. He was sentenced to prison and shortly thereafter there were six years worth of appeals filed by his original lawyer. After the sixth year of appeals that lawyer died and F. Lee Bailey took over and F. Lee Bailey filed a writ of habeas corpus in the federal district court. And the federal district court judge decided that, that essentially this was a mockery of jurisprudence. It was a mockery of justice. And that as a result, the verdict should be thrown out. And it was. And he was released on bond. State appealed to the uh, Sixth Circuit Court of Appeals. And the Sixth Circuit reversed. And after that reversal, Bailey took it to the Supreme Court, and the Supreme Court heard the case. It was an eight to one decision in favor of reversal. Here are some of the things that I thought were very important. First of all, it was called a carnival atmosphere out in front of the Sam Shepard trial. Uh, despite the excessive pretrial publicity, the trial judge failed to take effective measures against the massive publicity, which continued throughout the trial to take, and to take adequate steps to control 
the conduct of the trial. The petitioner, the petitioner filed a habeas corpus petition contending they did not receive a fair trial. The district court granted that writ. And then afterwards, the, the massive, persuade, pervasive, and prejudicial publicity attending petitioner's prosecution prevented him from receiving a fair trial consistent with the due process clause of the 14th Amendment. That's from the Supreme Court case. In addition to that, the court said, though freedom of discussion should be given the widest range compatible with a fair and orderly administration of justice, it must not be allowed to divert a trial from its purpose of adjudicating controversies according to legal principles based on evidence received only in open court. Identifiable prejudice to the accused need not be shown if, as in Estes versus Texas, and even more so in this case, the totality of the circumstances raises the probability of prejudice. So let's go back to the Chavin trial. Do the totality of circumstances, the fact that BLM said that they would burn the city to the ground if he wasn't convicted, the fact that Maxine Waters was out in front of the group advocating violence, advocating that the people stay in the streets until he was convicted, and Joe Biden's rather intemperate comments about the trial as well. So, in my opinion, again, the judge may not have intended to make an error, but by not sequestering the jury, and yes, Sam Shepard's jury was not sequestered either, and by not controlling the atmosphere and the pretrial publicity and its impact, by not sequestering that jury, the judge made a terrible error, and by not granting the mistrial, he made a terrible error. Now somebody asked me specifically what I thought the outcome of this would be, and I do believe that it will be reversed. If it's not reversed by the Minnesota Court of Appeals, it will be reversed by the Minnesota Supreme Court. And if for any reason the Minnesota Supreme Court does not reverse it, it will be reversed on habeas corpus or at the United States Supreme Court. So that's my take on the Chavin trial. Uh, if you found this interesting or useful, I hope that you would smash the like button. And uh, if you haven't already subscribed to our channel, subscribe so that you can be informed whenever we release a video here. Otherwise, thank you for watching and have a terrific day.